Hello, good morning. Uh, if I'm saying good morning. Uh, I appreciate for a lot of you it uh, will be the morning, uh, but for others uh, it will be a different time of the day. Uh, I want to apologise for this slightly late start there. Uh, I, I wasn't intending to use this computer, uh, and uh, as <laughs> as <laughs> as can often happen, these things because we're working in different circumstances uh, just now. The, uh, I've had a technical fault, so I've had to quickly change computer. Uh, and I, so I've just had somebody confirm that you can see and hear me, and I'm not sitting talking to myself. So let's start properly. So, welcome to this, uh, the first live stream uh, event of this run of Caring for Vulnerable Children. Uh, also, as, as goes, probably without saying, this run of this course is against a, a backdrop unlike any other. I think this is now our 11th or 12th run. Uh, of, the, of the course, and uh, um, we've never had circumstances like this uh, before uh, that, we're, that we're all experiencing, and uh, and it's making it a different sort of a different sort of course uh, this time round. So we're going to try and reflect some of that uh, in the in the next hour or so. But let's start with just kind of introducing myself. So my name is uh, Graham McPhee. I'm assuming most of you will know that by now because if you've been with us for the first two weeks uh, of the of the course, you know. Uh, I'm the lead educator on the programme. I'm based at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow uh, in Scotland. So I'd like to start just by welcoming everyone uh, to the course and to the first uh, live stream event, especially if this is your first future learning course and this might be your first live stream uh, event also. Uh, it probably goes without saying, when we, all the other runs of this course, when we do these live stream events, uh, I would be at the university and I would be running them a session, this sort of session from the studio. Uh, we would have kind of tech round about us, I would have a green screen behind me. Uh, as like a lot of people, I'm, I'm working at home, uh, so rather than a green screen behind me, I've got a green bed sheet uh, up over the, uh, the window to kind of make sure that I don't get too much light coming in, to check that you could see me okay. And then lo and behold, we have a technical fault and I'm on a, a different uh, computer screen than I anticipated, but but we uh, I, I can see and hear you, uh, so, so that shouldn't stop us uh, moving forward uh, today. I, I guess I'd, I'd also kind of just be, before we get into the content, content as such, just kind of kind of recognise that the different uh, kind of strains and anxieties that, that people will be experiencing with, with life just now, and, and also I say that the course is set against that that backdrop. So first and foremost, I hope everybody is doing okay, as well as as okay as you can uh, in the current circumstances. Kind of please look after yourself, look after the, the your your family. Uh, that, that you're you're with and and kind of kind of look out for yourself and look out for each other. It's probably never been more important uh, as a society that that we do that. So I hope that some of the the discussion we can have for the for the next hour as part of this session and also moving forward with the course uh, can can help us to think of, uh, about a number of issues. Some which might relate specifically to the to the current pandemic pandemic situation that we're experiencing uh, and others about looking after children uh, kind of more generally. So what we're, we're kind of plan to do in the session, I guess I've, I've got kind of three main things that I would uh, kind of, I would like to cover. Uh, one is uh, responding to the, and, and talking about the, the, the poll uh, that we had in first week, the introductory poll about kind of the actions to 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 risk and vulnerability and and the results that are there and just kind of some of the talking points that come up from that. Uh, secondly, going to spend a bit of time responding to some of your comments about Billy's story. Every time we run this course, uh, 
probably the, the Billy story element of it is the thing that generates the most discussion and the most comments. Uh, and that's it. that's been the same again for the first two weeks. So I'm going to kind of try and pick up on a number of the questions and comments that have been posed in relation to, to Billy's story. And then thirdly, I'm going to pick up on a range of other questions and, and comments that have been posted, not specifically about Billy's story, but just about other issues related to the course and, and themes that come up uh, from within it. Uh, but uh, before I go into that, I can almost kind of wipe out a disclaimer at the beginning. And as you say, for example, there's, it's impossible for me to respond to every question uh, that has been uh, that, that has been posted uh, because we, we've had such a fabulous uptake uh, in the course this time round. I, I guess partly because the situation that a lot of us find ourselves in, uh, I know that we've got lots of people registered on the course just now who are in who are in roles and in, in, in professions where they're. They're, they're having to work from home, and they've got a bit more time uh, for uh, for for kind of CPD or, or, or self development, or uh, in some instances, I think people looking for things to kind of keep themselves kind of occupied, and to a certain extent, taking their mind off other circumstances as well. So, with a fabulous update, the, the last figure I had was with seven thousand three hundred seventy-two people who joined the course uh, this time around, which is a fabulous number, uh, and we have got a truly international uh, audience this time. Out. We've got is 127 different countries represented and the people uh, joining the course. Vast majority from the UK, just under three quarters of from the UK, but we'll get sizable populations from Australia, Nigeria, South Africa, Ireland, Canada, USA, India, Ethiopia. These are just kind of some of the, uh, the, the, the biggest international populations that are registered as part of the programme. So I'd like to say kind of welcome to, to, to everybody. Uh, and, and it's great to have kind of such a, an international uh, audience. Uh, the okay, right. Sorry, I've just had a message. The, the, the other thing, just a kind of slight pause there. Uh, normally, I would, if I was at the studio in the university at the studio doing this, I would have Sarah uh, in the in the room with me, uh, and so. But I'm actually communicating with her by text because obviously she's working at home uh, as well, and she's uh, telling me that uh, that, that it, it's just to acknowledge the fact that. In terms of the connection, and I think this is a worldwide issue just now because we've got so many people working at home and so many people uh, using the internet that, that sometimes connections and connection speeds can be a bit variable. Uh, so the, just uh, in terms of the, the, the sound sometimes being a bit kind of coming and going, although she's telling me it's better now. So hopefully uh, the sound uh, will, will stay good throughout uh, the, the, the hour of the session. So let's let's jump into the materials. So I say, can I see things? Can I want to... To, to think about it, and the first being uh, the poll. So in, you remember in week one, uh, we give you 10, it almost is a kind of bit of a warm-up exercise, kind of 10 very short scenarios and said, pick the three that you think uh, kind of, uh, are represent the most in terms of kind of potential risk, potential vulnerability. So, so at the outset, it's, it's important to say that, that, that this is this is kind of nothing more than an academic exercise. We want to get people to think about risk and vulnerability and how to be begin to assess that, how to begin to kind of measure, kind of think about that, and how might we translate that into a professional setting where we're thinking about having to make about decisions about potential risk and vulnerability for children and young people. And uh, if any professional involved in, in, in kind of real life decision making, we would be looking for a whole lot more information uh, bef before, we could, be, before we could kind of make substantial decisions. But nonetheless, this was a kind of useful exercise. Now, it was interesting. Now, if you, if you haven't already, if you go onto the to the course page for that exercise, you'll see that we've posted the results uh, in terms of kind of how you voted in relation to this. And there was a couple of scenarios that generated an, an, an awful lot of votes. So the, 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 the first scenario, a tiny baby has been given a violent shaking by their carer and has learned difficulties and upset because the baby won't stop crying. 80% of you identified that. So all the people that voted four out of every five had that in their top three. And it, it's unsurprising. It, 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 it's a scenario that involves a, a, a kind of small baby who has no agency for themselves, who's totally dependent on adult carers round about them. And, and in this scenario, we've got an adult carer who, who, who isn't able to tune in in, in a, in a, a a nuanced or a meaningful way in terms of the interpreting that the, the baby's behaviour and, and understanding what the what the baby and what the child needs and and is the potential to respond 
in a, a different way that uh, is going to be meaningful and safe for that child. So it's unsurprising that that's there uh, with 80%. And likewise, the, the scenario that got second most votes was a scenario that said a six-month-old baby boy who has not had any attention or anything to eat for 10 hours. 61% uh, of you, 61% uh, of you uh, can identify that. And again, it's a six-month-old baby. So again, little in the way of kind of aid, nothing in the way that necessarily of agents able to kind of fend for themselves etc relying on the kind of care of others and and so again unsurprising that so many of you are are selecting that so we've got this theme of when when children are absolutely especially young children when babies are absolutely dependent on adults for for all their kind of care and protection needs when the adults aren't in a position to provide that or perhaps aren't providing that, then that's rating very highly in terms of kind of risk and vulnerability. But also there was other scenarios there with, with older children. So so that issue of agency and, and children able to, to to influence things to some extent for themselves uh, becomes less less of an issue. But yet, no, the, the scenario that got third most votes, and it was a scenario was a 15-year-old girl who's recently been befriended by a man who's persuaded her to do sexual things to him in exchange for money and affection. So yes, she's, she's older, but clearly a, a, a scenario that, that's got a lot of risk uh, and concern uh, tied up within it. And 54% of you identified that uh, within the, the, the top uh, the top three. So so again, can, again, not totally surprising that that's there in, in that level. However, there's, I, I, I guess, how much would we need to change that scenario? Uh, and if it was not a 15-year-old girl, if it was a kind of slightly older young woman, my guess is it would have got less than 54%. However, the, the element of power and coercion uh, would still be there in terms of somebody trying to persuade that young girl to do some to do sexual things in exchange for money and affection that would still raise a, a kind of a lot of risk and concerns, uh, and and so my expectation it, it would still be res, res, uh, represented highly, but possibly uh, a bit later. Uh, the going to the other end of the scale, I, I, because I'm not, I'm not going to talk through all ten of them in this in this session, but it, it's interesting the scenario that that gathered the least votes. And it was a scenario that says an eight-year-old girl of Af Afro-Caribbean origin who's just had her hair cut short because her white foster carer finds it difficult to manage. It gathered 1% of the vote. So 1% if you put that uh, in your top three. And again, compared to the scenarios that got the most votes in terms of kind of young children, babies absolutely dependent on the care of adults and that not being provided, potential physical risk, a risk of harm, kind of potentially not being fed, etc., and the impact that that could have. Not at all surprising that this scenario, by contrast, gets a whole lot less votes. But is this still a potentially damaging, risky situation? Absolutely. So, so that, that this child is, you know, the, the scenario is, is about the hair being cut, so we'll get no, we'll get no indication of, of physical harm. But Let's imagine this sort of scenario and this sort of development playing out uh, over, a, over a long period of time where a young person's uh, cultural identity, cultural heritage, sense of self, sense of belonging, kind of where they come from, who they are, has been totally, has, has been continually dismissed diminished, no value placed on it, it's not something that's important. And the thing about this scenario is they've cut the hair because the foster carer finds it difficult to manage. This isn't about the young person's needs, this is about the adult's needs. And if that begins to, if that continues to play out in that way in terms of the needs of the foster carer outweigh the needs of the of the young person, then as, as time goes on, that becomes more risky and more vulnerable in terms of that, that young person's sense of self, their, uh, how, how they're going to grow and, and develop. And, and yeah, there, there might not necessarily be the, 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 the physical risk and vulnerability that we see represented in some of the other scenarios listed here, but it's still something that we absolutely need to be concerned about. So as I say, this this was a bit of a kind of starter exercise in, in week one to get us thinking about kind of risk and, and, and vulnerability with very 
with with very short uh, uh, scenarios to, to get us started. I'd like to move on to, to Billy's story. Uh, Billy's story, uh, as I say, probably every time we run the course generates the most the most comments. So, so let, let's just kind of start with a couple of things about Billy's story before we move on to uh, try and respond to some of the questions uh, that have been posed here. So Billy's story is, is fictional. In a sense, so, so uh, you know, Billy's not a real person, and, and this was created for the purpose of the course. However, the circumstances and the events that play out in Billy's story f over for the first two weeks and for the for the next four weeks, for the six weeks in total, are are absolutely based in reality. And in a obviously Billy's story is set in in Scotland, uh, where we are here at the University of Strathclyde. Uh, uh, so, so whilst it, 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 it's fictional, it's, it's very much based in reality. And there are lots of billies up and down the country in these sorts of situations and, and similar uh, kind of situations. And so the, using Billy's story as a way in to talking about a whole range of, of issues and, and challenges is, is something that's kind of quite useful for us. So huge amount of questions, huge amounts of comments posted about Billy. As I say, I, I can't... I can't hope, uh, I, there's no way I can respond to all of them. So what I've tried to do is pull out some comments and arrange them around about themes because there's a number of themes jumping out at me from the comments that are being being posted. And the, the, the first kind of theme I, I kind of really want to kind of pick up on is the, 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 the notion of this theme of kind of early intervention about kind of when would be the right time to be intervening with, with Billy. When would be the the, best, the the optimum time to get in and, and be getting uh, some support in there? So it, it probably is, no, Billy. And, and again, if, again, actually, before I before I say the next bit, I think we need to uh, the first bit. Of what I'm going to say is here is pre COVID nineteen, uh, because all the material in the course was also created prior to to COVID nineteen. The world has changed immeasurably. Uh, in the in the last couple of months, and uh, it, it's almost impossible to imagine us going necessarily back to the way things were, uh, and that there, there's going to be long-standing changes in, in, a, in a variety of ways, and and this will impact on scenarios such as Billy and and Billy's mum, etc. Because pre-COVID nineteen, uh, I think what I've been saying is when when we're getting comments in about the the services need to get somebody, and it might be kind of community services, social work, the education department, a GP, whoever it is, need to get in there and offer some support. Billy and, and his mum need some some support. And and part of my response at that stage would be yes. However, in a Scottish and UK context, within the services and resources that we have available to us, the that I think the reality and, and the challenge in reality for us would be that Billy, in many instances, wouldn't be seen as a high priority case because we've got a number of services not with the resources to do work that might be classed as preventative and getting in at an early stage, this notion of early intervention, even though so much of the evidence points towards early intervention being one of the most effective things we can do, rather than waiting for crises to happen and trying to respond to families who are, in, who, who are, who are at crisis point and facing a whole range of challenges, that the earlier we can get in and intervene in a more low-level way, offering kind of support and, and, a, and a range of different a, a range of different resources, then we we can stop crises happening rather than being in a kind of firefighting mode. But sadly, in in relation to a, 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 just a whole range of services, be it be it social work, be it community support services, be it kind of community mental health services, etc. There's often long waiting lists for services. It's often difficult for us to access some of the professional services and supports uh, that are that are required. So, so seeing that, that a lot of these comments about we, we, we should get in and support Billy at an earlier stage, undoubtedly the more support we can offer to Billy and his family at this stage, the, the better. However, 
it, it's hard to imagine Billy's case being much of a priority. And, and again, I'm talking there pre-COVID-19. If we think about it, certainly in a UK context, about what is going on just now, uh, then that becomes even more so the case because we we are responding to a crisis the likes of which we've never experienced before, and and the the, the issues that are presented to to kind of services are just so so profound that that cases such as Billy's family will slip even further down the down the kind of list of priorities, and 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 especially with the with the kind of lockdown situation that we find ourselves in, with families being more and more kind of separated off and, and isolated from each other uh, in our in our homes and having less contact and being less being less visible and less present, then it's, it's going to be even harder for agencies to 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 identify and provide support to to families such as Billy. So so when when I'm responding to this by saying that uh, I don't think Billy's going to be a high priority, that is by me that I, I'm not at all saying I don't think Billy needs support. I don't think Billy needs services. But one of the challenges for us would be about that. how do we actually achieve that uh, in, in the kind of current resource situation that we're in, and that's even before before kind of COVID COVID nineteen. Because I mean, what we have seen over the last ten years is a, is a huge cutting of budgets of social services, education, uh, for a lot of health services as well, and and so a, a lot of agencies been having less resource, being less agile, being able to be less responsive and, and doing a lot of the a less preventative stuff that's going on. So that, that raises some questions about what what can we do? And some of the comments I've, I've had, so I've, I've pulled out a couple because I think they're kind of quite interesting. So one from somebody, Claudia M. So Claudia, thank you for your, for your comment. She said, I'm interested to know more about how teachers can offer practical support to look after children or children going through experiences like Billy's. Uh, particularly in the classroom in terms of activities and, and she asked about could we do more physical sensory emotional ways of working can you expand this and, and so I, I think it's a really interesting question Claudia I think a lot of people would, would would agree with you the more that we could do in relation to that the better equally we know that schools and teachers are facing all sorts of again even you know, putting aside COVID-19 and, and kind of where the education system's at just now, even before that, the demands and challenges and, and what is expected of schools in terms of kind of uh, uh, the curriculum, attainment, kind of exams, grades, etc., and even just the whole school league table culture uh, that we that we have created and, and how, how as a society or a system we value and, and rate schools and, and what's seen as important and what's not because you no know, league, league tables and such like are determined by exam outcomes uh, and such like and a lot of the, the kind of softer things that are what we might describe as the softer things you mentioned about kind of sensory emotional things it's sometimes it's quite hard for them to be represented within schools when we're facing all these different challenges uh, and demands so it does kind of ask the thing about right, well, how can we create a, a, a School, how can we create school environments and educational experiences that, that do all the necessary academic and attainment bits, but do lots of the, the other stuff? And then actually, when we bring this into the context of COVID-19, and, there, and there's a case they're saying that actually we've never needed that more than ever now. I mean, the, even though lockdown is kind of rel is kind of still kind of relatively new and short for us, certainly in the, in the UK, that the we already knew that we had a number of, an increasing number of young people experiencing mental health issues. That is going to be multiplied by any, by a, 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 a huge factor with the kind of current situation, a lot of the kind of challenges and struggles and isolation that a lot of young people are experiencing. So thinking about how we support them uh, in a, in, in a in a more in terms of the kind of their emotional development and kind of relationally that this is a, this is a kind of real challenge for us just now in this current situation and then thinking about the types of the types of kind of school experiences we would like in children to have and uh, kind of to, to to move forward so that i guess in a sense the the more the more we can support teachers and schools and all the professionals within schools to do this the the, the better but that perhaps might cause us to have to think about right. Well, kind of, does that involve either having to put 
more resource into schools or does it involve us having to kind of almost kind of recalibrate what we're asking schools to do to a certain extent because if we're still going to have this huge that, that you know that and you know that the pace of learning especially when, when we get to secondary school and and children working towards kind of nat fives hires advanced hires the pace is absolutely relentless in terms of curriculum and and children and teachers experiencing that just 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 about kind of milestone after milestone in terms of kind of what they've got to work through uh, to, to to move forward and does it leave any adequate space for emotional holding containment the, the sensory things and and for so as to actually kind of think about what what do we want kind of schools to to, to do and and the, the, is it is it purely about education or can or can they be providing a uh, other a uh, other other aspects of support and and development so i'm going to pause and just take a drink of water because i'm aware that I'm, uh, i'll be doing a lot of talking over the next yeah and yeah, I, I can see the comments coming up uh, that have been posted here, and I've just responded to one from uh, Linda Mullins. Linda, thank you for making the comment there. And she says, yeah, many teachers would need input to enable them to widen their mindset to include nurture as well. I, I, yeah, I, I absolutely, I absolutely recognise that if if we were to try to think more in this way, then we would need to support. All the teachers and all the professional staff that would be expecting of this. There's absolutely no point being in a school setting or anywhere else to say to say people, hey, stop doing this and start doing that without giving them the support, the guidance, the input to enable them and help them to, to achieve that. Uh, that would no that, that we, we've got to kind of take people kind of take people with us in that sense. So yeah, I, I would agree that we would need to that we would need to support the, the teachers and the professional staff to, to think more in that way. And I've got other comments that kind of picked up in similar things. There was a comment from uh, Louise M and she asked the question, because also in Billy's story, we are seeing the scenario where he's, he's, he's spending some time with his guidance teacher, which which seems to be a positive thing. And, and Louise, thank you for your question. Uh, she she asked the, the question, does the information that Billy shares with his guidance teacher get fed back to support care services to initiate but support for Billy and start the, the ball rolling as part of a team initiative. Now that, that's an interesting question as well. And I guess my, my response to that, Louise, would be the starting point for that would need to be the almost the kind of what was it in terms of those initial conversations that Billy was having with Mr. Merton, his kind of guidance teacher, uh, and in terms of kind of what's the what's the norms and expectations within the, the school uh, in terms of uh, in, in terms of uh, is it a case of kind of what happens that conversation stays there or, or do things get passed on or not and certainly what we wouldn't be wanting to happen Lise, is for be it Mr Merton or anybody else or Billy to be saying things and for the teachers almost behind Billy's back to, to be going away and 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 Billy thinking he's got a safe space and 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 not being aware of the fact that this information might get passed on or something's going to happen about it. Now, I, I would see kind of teachers in the same situation as social workers and a whole range of other professionals at that duty of care. And, and actually the comments are coming in so fast uh, down the, the chat bar just now, it's almost impossible for me to read them as they're coming in. I've seen duty of care mentioned there a couple of times. And uh, any of us in that situation, if a child was saying something to us that, we, that caused us concerns about immediate risk harm protection issues I, I, we would be duty bound to, to act upon that the, the point i'm saying about that about the billy being part of that if if that happens because uh, of the you know, we, we might experience situations where a child says i'm going to tell you this but i don't want you to pass it on and and right at the outside outset we would need to make it clear in that situation if you're saying that if you give me information that that causes me concern about your risk, your well-being or the risk uh, or about the kind of health and well-being of somebody else, then I can't promise to keep that to myself. I'm going to have to share that with somebody and I'll let you know that I'm doing that and, and we can have a conversation about how how we uh, how, how we take this forward best, but, but I just can't sit with this information. So, so Lise, that, that bit about the what gets shared and what doesn't, to a certain extent, it depends on what the nature of it is. There, there might be lots of it just that sits between Billy and, and Mr. Merton, and Mr. Merton might encourage Billy to start thinking about, well, 
would it be helpful you to have this conversation with your mum or can or can we take this somewhere else in a way that's going to help you or, or not? So so that might be one element to it. Whereas if, if there was something if there was something more immediate in terms of kind of risk and protection, then then that would need to be shared. And good practice would be that Billy Billy would be made aware that that was that was happening. I'd like to pick on another uh, kind of couple of comments, all all about kind of a. Uh, uh, all about Billy's story. Uh, the question from Sarah Ross, and, and I've picked this 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 comment out because it's something that doesn't just sit in Billy's story, but Sarah asks the question, how early does early intervention need to be? Is primary too late or can their behaviours and issues surrounding attachment can be improved or healed at a later stage? Or does it just get harder to help them later, the later they are identified? And I think that the, the message that that, that I would want to be in across, and then certainly at, at the University of South Clyde, you know, within the within all the the the, the, the schools and departments that, that might be involved in educating, training, be it social workers, uh, teachers, kind of any kind of kind of health, kind of social care professionals, we it, it's never too late for us to make a positive. A, a, a positive intervention, and and so we should never be kind of at the notion of kind of writing anybody off. It's too late to impact in anything. We we have always got the potential to help, support, heal, contain, etc. And and that 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 should just underpin our approach to all the children and young people that that we encounter. Does it get harder the later the issues are identified? I think unarguably, yes. Uh, the, 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 if, if services or professionals become aware of children and some of the issues uh, that the children are experiencing later down the line and young people have had kind of more exposure to kind of potentially damaging, harmful experiences, then there is more likelihood of that having had more impact on them. And and the the, the, the task in, for people in terms of trying to support those young people can become all the more challenging. So so yeah, it, it can get it can get harder the later some of these issues are identified, but absolutely we should be trying to intervene and support all children and young people, regardless of 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 the their age or, or their age or stage. Obviously, the scenario in Billy's story is a secondary school, and I'm going to actually I was going to say something there, and I would be giving away a spoiler because you've still got another four weeks of Billy's story uh, to come. So I'm going to stop with that chain. I thought we'll maybe pick that conversation up in two weeks' time uh, when you've seen the next two weeks uh, of of Billy's story. One other comment about Billy. I think this is a really important one. Uh, Caroline Kennett, Caroline, thanks for your comment. She says, although Billy is getting support through school, does this continue through the school holidays so he doesn't feel completely isolated with his problems? So I, we'll pick up on that and then go on to say, does Billy get support with his mental health and to help understand what's happening with his mum's mental health? Uh, so two really important points. Actually, I'm going to deal with the second one first. The, the second one first, uh, now, actually, there's a number of comments, and I think are kind of kind of very kind of strong arguments to support these comments. Just excuse me a second. That perhaps the most effective way of supporting Billy would be to try and support his mum. And and so there's lots of comments about what Billy needs, but if we can support Billy's family structure. Uh, and bolster that, then is that the most effective way of supporting Billy? So this this issue of helping Billy to understand what's going on and what's happening with his mum's mental health, but actually supporting Billy's mum with her mental health and impacting on her ability to to be there for Billy, to be present, to uh, to, to to care for him, then then that in many ways might be the most significant way uh, to. Uh, to support Billy. And again, I'm seeing comments come in, so I just can saw one there, can I, Ryan, would Billy benefit from a pretender? Absolutely, potentially, yes. And can I watch this space in terms of how Billy's story uh, develops? 
go back to the, the first point of a uh, kind of uh, that Caroline raised. Billy's getting support through, through the schools. Does this continue through, through the school holidays? That question actually jumped out at me, Caroline, because of the situation that we find ourselves in now in, in many countries with COVID-19 with schools being closed. And I, I guess I can speak most to what's happening in Scotland and the UK, but kind of, kind of recognising that this may well be a scenario that is playing out in a whole variety of countries around the world. We know that many children and young people get a lot of key services via school. And, and for some, it can be as, as, as key and fundamental as it might be the, the, the best or the most consistent meal that they get every day being at, being at school uh, and, and uh, alongside a lot of other things uh, that, that might happen. So we are being presented with a, a profound set of challenges just now as a, as a society in terms of schools being closed and, and a lot of young people not been, been, well, no young people being at school and those young people not having access to a lot of those more kind of uh, basic and underpinning supports and services uh, that, that would normally be part of their, their experience. And so at a basic level just now, some of it is, is about food and, and sustenance. I think it's a really important point about taking that beyond the, the, the physical food and sustenance but and about kind of emotional support and, and well-being and a lot of things that, that children will get uh, from from attending school and I mean there's already very worrying statistics in the UK I mean I, I saw a report a couple of days ago that suggesting that in any given day in the UK just now up to 1.5 million people are potentially not eating anything for for a whole day uh, because of the, the situation that they find themselves in due to COVID-19 and, and <clears throat> pardon me about that kind of lack of resources, food, money and, and things like that. So, so young people being out of school and, and not having access to these support services is, is, is a really significant kind of challenge uh, for us. And I mentioned earlier about it. Well, yeah, I think it's almost impossible to imagine us just going back to the way things were before it, and it, it feels you know, that this, this virus is, is going to be with us for, for a, well, it's going to be with us forever, potentially, uh, but it's going to be with us for the next while in terms of us not having a response uh, to it in terms of a, a, a vaccine. So quite how schools are going to be functioning even come August, September, it's almost impossible for us to imagine at this time. And that, and, and I mentioned earlier that the word about kind of recalibration, do, do we need to think differently about how we, we, we support and bolster some of these children and young people who would normally access a lot of that support via a school system? Because if the school system is going to have to operate differently, then that presents some, some kind of significant challenges for us. I'm going to leave Billy's story uh, for just now, because I've got some other questions that I would like to uh, kind of respond to, but I always say that also Billy's story uh, continues for the for the next uh, four weeks. We use it to try and raise or uh, kind of gives a bit of an insight into a number of kind of different issues that are relevant when thinking about how we how we kind of care for and respond to children who might be experiencing a range of different vulnerabilities uh, and and risk issues. So in two weeks' time, uh, the story will have moved on. Uh, again, and, and we'll be able to talk about different aspects of it. I'd like to pick up on some other other questions that, that were posed, well, questions and comments. Some, the, the, sometimes I'm getting specific questions, but sometimes it's more a kind of general comment uh, for me to respond to. But I can, a, num a number of kind of interesting themes uh, coming up. So I, I saw a comment from Sonia Mitchell. So Sonia, thanks for your uh, for your comment. It's quite a long comment. Uh, I want to pick up on the the. the the element your comment when you were talking about people's uh, if people are having kind of poor attachment experiences because obviously in week two uh, we had some material on attachment you listened to Judy Furnival uh, talking about attachment and there was some other material uh, associated with that and and Judy at one point in her talk mentioned uh, about the, the the fact that a number of people who may end up with kind of in, in difficult circumstances and poor outcomes in later life may have had really difficult attachment experiences in their in their childhood. And and there's a particular part of the question you say, is there a point in time when it becomes too late to reverse the damage done by a poor attachment experience? And again it's almost making a pick you know, kind of 
relating back to kind of what I said about a couple of minutes ago is we've always got the potential to to, to make positive interventions. We've always got the potential to 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 to, to help, to offer uh, support, to offer guidance, and offer people the, the opportunity for 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 growth and healing. Yes, the bit earlier is still true that the the longer it takes for for support to be put in place, for things to be uncovered, then the more of a challenge that might be to, to help people in terms of kind of issues might become more kind of deep rooted or, or, or more profound, profound. But we've still absolutely always got the potential to, to, to help. So the the, the phrase in there is to, to reverse the damage done. Do we, in, in any situation, do we ever reverse the damage? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that's what we're ever really kind of trying to do. I don't, I, and, I, and I say that not necessarily in a, in a critical way. So it's just like, I'm not sure that's necessarily achievable for us. We can't change the experiences that people have had. So we can't reverse the experience. But what we can do is try to support, uh, be it children, young adults, or people in later life, to as much as possible make sense of come to terms and find a way of, of, of and find a way of moving forward that makes sense for them and and a number of people will continue to experience and experience ongoing challenges in relation to some of those early childhood experiences but but it's our it's our role it's it, I, I think it's incumbent upon us all actually not just as whatever role or profession be it professional or volunteering role that we may, might be in but actually just as human beings uh, that for us always to 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 see the the, the positive potential for, for, for growth, for healing, for development, uh, and, and try and engage our interactions with each other uh, in, in that way. So thanks for the, the comment, uh, Sonia. I want to pick up another comment. It was from Fiona J. So Fiona, thank you for your uh, for, for your comment. And you you picked up on uh, the, the input by uh, Laura Steckley. And Laura was talking about, uh, about amongst other things, about a uh, a containment and, and holding environments and that really seemed to that seemed that it, it was a really interesting subject for a lot of people judging by the amount of comments uh, that, that we got about it and, and you asked and you said I find this really interesting I wonder if you could discuss containment and holding environments further perhaps in the, in, in the context of Billy <clears throat> but all I want to do is to actually bring it up in the context of what we're all experiencing just now Because I think that the concept of containment and holding environments feels more relevant for the world than it's ever felt be before. That the, the, the world for many of us feels very uncontained. Uh, just now many of us are left feeling very uncontained because there's so much uncertainty, so much potential worry, so much stress. A lot of, the th the, the, a lot of us have been, the, the, the normal structures and routines that would, that, 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 that would kind of help us to navigate life have been removed and, and we find ourselves in kind of, kind of strange, challenging, different situations. And, and so, so, so lots of uncontained feelings, lots of insecurities. Uh, and, and so, so for many of us and, and actually for society as a whole, in terms of thinking that how, how do we kind of we achieve some sort of kind of equilibrium here? And the, the concepts of containment and holding environments, I think, become kind of really important in, in that sense at a society, societal level. In terms of thinking about the children and young people that we, that we might be working with and might be supporting, it's, more, it's going to be more challenging for us to do this in the current situation because for a lot of the young people, it's more difficult for us to access them. Uh, because as I mentioned, if young people aren't at school or aren't accessing some of the services that they normally would, then then it, it, it becomes difficult for us to offer that that notion of of support. But uh, I mean, I'd, I I guess part of the reason I got Laura to to come and do the session to be part of the program, quite apart from the fact that she's a colleague that I work with uh, on a on a very regular basis, I, I think the, these concepts of of containment. And, and and holding environments and thinking about the kind of what what children how we can best help children uh, is is one that is, is is fundamental to the to to our understanding of kind of supporting 
children who might be experiencing adverse situations, risk, and 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 how how we can how we can try to support them through that. Uh, so, and uh, Katie, I don't, uh, Katie, I'm, I, I don't know if you've held your finger down on the button or something. I'm, I'm seeing we're getting a long list of one-letter comments uh, that, that that's causing the chat to go in that direction. So I got sort of distracted by seeing what was coming up in the chat there at the end. A uh, another comment from Angela Ald. Angela, thank you for your uh, for for this comment, uh, and it, it it picks up in a lot of the the chat that I've seen coming up in the chat, but it, it has been going too fast for me to kind of, kind of see everything that's been coming up. But uh, Angela said, I would like to know whether you think it's a good idea for all staff from high schools to receive mandatory training on subjects like attachment and trauma training. And then you're going to kind of say a lot of things. Now, there's there's been a lot of comments I've been seeing in the chat bar kind of related to this about the about potential, because Billy's story, and we, and we see Billy interacting with his guidance teacher uh, and the... And, and the and the scenario, and I see the comment just come up from there, and from Mary Donaldson. Mary, yeah, I, I think there's huge time and workload issues for for teachers. And again, that's you know, going back to that point about what I said about the the the, the whole kind of exam attainment culture and kind of what we what we ask schools and teachers to do, and then how much space or resource do we create for for that other sorts of supports and other sorts of development uh, so uh, the in terms of Angela's questions uh, about kind of mandatory training and some sort of attachment trauma training is, is that something that, that needs to be represented more in in teacher training courses potentially uh, in order that that teachers feel more equipped and knowledgeable uh, in, in relation to this but then there's absolutely no point in us representing that in courses if when teachers, for instance, go into the workplace that they are that they, they feel they, they don't have the, the time or the space to, to think and engage in that way at all because they're getting so hammered with assessments, marking and, and the, the, the turnover and churn that can be associated with some of the, the edu ed educational tasks. So Angela, the answer to your question is yes. I think it would be good if if we had as many key professionals that support children and young people, especially vulnerable children and young people, to be as informed and knowledgeable about issues such as attachment, the impact of trauma, and how this can how this can impact on young people's growth, development, behaviour, so that we can understand uh, some of the behaviours that are exhibit, exhibited in a in a more nuanced way and respond to them in a, in a in a supportive way. But there's no point in us putting that into courses if when people in the workplace don't actually, we don't give them the time and the space and the tools to actually uh, practice some of that. So again, come back to kind of what do we want? For, and so you know, we're talking about this in schools in relation to teachers, but I also mentioned a bit about a lot of other services, it, 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 a lot of it's, almost more kind of crisis driven firefighting because resources are such that we're only getting a chance to intervene when when things reach crisis point and and, and again thinking about how does there need to be a again use this phrase again a recalibration of the system uh, to, to allow more preventative support of nurturing work to happen at an early stage and and I see comment here from Cam Byrne about kind of Cam, thanks for your comment there about that. Well, we can have different people in different roles who who can often try and do some of this. And, and yeah, these, these are absolutely invaluable resources uh, within schools. And I know we've got a lot of people on the course that I saw from the sign ups in terms of the comments that, that uh, people were were saying about people in a whole range of different kind of support roles and support settings, uh, different early years practitioners, uh, classroom assistants, whole range of different roles. And, and and some of these people sometimes might have more chance to, or more time to do uh, kind of, uh, some of this. But again, I think we, we need to enable and support them to be able to carry out that role. So that there, there's, again, there's, there's the, 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 the the, the bit about how we set systems up, how we create, be it school settings, school structures, other other settings, in order that we enable people to carry out these roles effectively. 
I've got two final comments I'd like to, to respond to be, before we kind of think about uh, kind of finishing up. Uh, one is one was from a uh, Jane McIntyre. Jane, thanks for your comment. Uh, you picked up on the the kind of nature nurture because obviously that that was part of the discussion uh, in in week two, and you. You asked the question, how are we in Scotland helping new parents nurture their babies? I know that nursery hours have been extended or will be after the pandemic subsides, but what have we in place to help parents of, of newborns? I think it's, it's a really interesting question, and, I, and I'm particularly picking up on this, going back to the fact we've got such a, an international audience, and, and yet we've we'll, we'll more people from the UK than from anywhere else, but I said at the beginning, we've got 127 uh, different countries represented, and I think because there's different answers to this in different cultures and different contexts, because in, in different societies and different cultures, there's different levels accept, of acceptance about state involvement uh, in, in, in the, 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 the life of people that within society, and, and certainly thinking about parents and who's got the right to, to, to decide what about children. So if we take the example of the US, for instance, where the... Uh, UN Declaration of Rights and the Rights of the Child has, has never has never been signed. Now, th th that's partly a kind of long kind of political history to it, but it reflects something about kind of certain American values about it's, it's, it's not for the state to tell parents how to look after children. It's for parents to decide how best to kind of look after children and and kind of uh, and and that about being the driving force, whereas. If we jump to the other end of the scale, where kind of countries, especially kind of perhaps more kind of Scandinavian countries and and kind of in, in our countries in Europe, where I think culturally there's much more acceptance of the the role of the state and a whole ver and a whole range of uh, kind of functions across society, and part of that would be about helping to to support parents and, and being involved in the, in the life of kind of children in different ways. Now we'll pick up on this a, lo a little bit in some of the later weeks when we when we think about social pedagogy which is the kind of, a, a, kind of a, a, an approach to thinking about and caring for children which kind of a, a, in many mainland European countries especially a lot of the kind of a, a Scandinavian countries where social pedagogy is, is kind of very kind of influential and very, very embedded in, in, a, in a lot of practice. So, so this question of kind of how involved do we get with parents and newborns or not? I think the answer, often the answer to that, is very cultural and kind of context uh, uh, specific. And and we we, we probably probably in Scotland that we we've seen a move towards us becoming more involved. In, and and I guess it depends. Who you speak to as as a response here, because some people will respond in a way saying this is this is excellent and and, and a really positive development that more supports have been offered and, and and the state has been a bit more involved in in the, the, the life of children and young people right from the beginning and supporting parents. Whereas you wouldn't have to go too far to try to to, to find. Uh, people who who will be critical of this and say this is the one of the phrases you hear. This is the nanny state kind of getting involved and kind of trying to take over and, and tell us how to kind of bring children up, etc. So, so there, 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 there can be different there can be different takes and I, I guess different societies negotiate that in, in different ways. But so so thank you for the thank you for the question. The the, the final comment I want to pick up on was a uh, from Sandra. Nib Dubada, Sandra, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly there. Uh, and, and you said, in light of COVID-19, at some stage, and at some stages, schools are turning also, we don't know, in the UK context, we don't know when that's going to be. What would you put in place for all students? Uh, can I, and you, 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 although you say primary, primarily five to 12 year olds to support them, and specifically for, for students who have significant uh, attachment difficulties. I think this feels like quite a relevant question to answer. And as a precursor, I, I, I don't have a silver, I'm not going to sit here with a silver bullet in terms of I think uh, this this is what solves this. It's it probably reiterating the point that I think if COVID-19 and the pandemic and lockdown has demonstrated anything to us, that the way that we think about supporting vulnerable children has it, it's never been more important that we do that but we are going to have to think very differently about how we continue to do this in the move in the world moving forward. 
uh, because it, it feels like many of our structures and systems are uh, we're, we're, there's not going to be a flick of the switch in three or four weeks' time. I don't think there's even going to be a flick of the switch in six months' time uh, in terms of everything back to back to normal as 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 it was again. And uh, I think the, the the issues that we experience and uh, will raise some kind of quite profound questions about how we continue to support children moving forward. And linking this back to the earlier questions about what happens to children when they're out of school, if they're accessing support services via school, and actually do we need to find do we need to think kind of more systemically about actually how do we ensure that that, that a lot of these supports and services do continue uh, year round for instance and are not dependent uh, on, on school. You no know, in a in a UK context before COVID nineteen we saw you no know, we, we, we've seen massive rises in, in the, the need and uptake for food banks for instance. That's been exaggerated even more uh, in the last kind of kind of four or five weeks. These issues aren't aren't, aren't going to go away. Uh, we're, we're we're looking at a, a massive economical recession and the and the, the impact that that's going to place on household incomes and potentially placing more people into poverty. And we've not even really mentioned poverty. And if you think about kind of where the course started in week one, and it was interesting to see the, the amount of comments about people expressing real surprise that my goodness, have we got this many people living in poverty in Scotland? We got this many children living day to day, week to week in poverty in Scotland. We're, we're in the Western world, industrialised nation, uh, kind of relatively wealthy in the grand scheme of things, and yet we've got inequality on, on this scale. So I, I think we, we've got really significant questions about kind of thinking about how we want to move this uh, moving forward. I'm aware I've got just short of an hour, and an hour was what I had uh, in in mind for uh, for running the session, so I'm I'm just going to kind of think about kind of winding things up. It's been great to see so many comments coming in up the side. It's been impossible for me to. I, I, you'll see, I've responded to to the odd one because it just came in at the right time, and and it's and it's kind of caught my eye and it fitted into to what I was talking about. So thank you for the for the for the level of engagement. Thank you for the amount of questions and comments that are that are being. Posted. And what I would really encourage everybody to do is that to get the most out of the, the kind of learning experience of being in the program is because because I can't hope to respond that there's we we'll get thousands upon thousands of comments so that, that it's absolutely impossible for me to, to to respond to them all. But have conversations amongst yourself. Respect each other's opinions. There's different opinions out there, and I, I saw some interesting uh, conversations developing where there clearly was different opinions about nature nurture about the nature of poverty and and about different attitudes and how we can kind of best help families how, how we can best help children in these situations so so keep keep the keep the conversations respectful and meaningful but but absolutely kind of challenge each other uh, in terms of the in, in, in terms of the discussions uh, that you're having we'll be doing this again in, in two weeks time uh, hopefully I'll be using the camera that's slightly above this one where I'll have the screen up above me I'm not quite sure what happened I'm just glad that we managed that I managed to get it sorted quickly and get us up and running uh, for for the session so you, you hopefully you won't be sitting looking up my nose uh, when we do it in, in two weeks time so we'll have this at the, at the end of week four between now and then look after yourself look after your families uh, keep safe and 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 just do. I think all that we can ask of everybody is now that we all just do the best that we can, uh, and look out for ourselves and look out for each other uh, during this period and support everybody through this. So I'll see everybody in two weeks' time uh, for the the live stream at the end of week four. Okay. Thanks for now. Bye.